Um, talk about girder or erection. I misspelled work. All right, girder erection. You got problems with your girder erection? Call Mark Martin. Call us. Yeah, didn't I get a phone? Yeah. All right, we're, like I said, we're focusing mostly on problem areas that we see. So we're going to talk about um, storage and handling of girders, a um, little bit about bearings and adjusting those and storage and um, so forth. Diaphragm fit up and girder rotation. We'll start off with uh, storage and handling of girders. Um, specs require us to load, transport, unload, and store structural materials so that the metal is kept clean and free from damage. Um, you have to block it up on site. It needs to be on timber. Um, it goes on to say don't bend, twist, damage, or excessively stress any materials. So what do you think about this? Is this a proper method of storage? Um, they got their, their timber blocking here, but they didn't support it, so um, these girders obviously fell over, so that's obviously not acceptable um, method of storage. Um, if you do, these are steel girders, um, probably a little bit more of an issue with concrete girders if you have something fall, you know, it's more likely to crack, cause problems. Um, if you do have something like this, you can get m &T to come out and they can, um, they can do some testing to make sure for any cracks. And you can still get cracks on, on these steel girders like this and damage from, uh, from falls or, or dropping them once you're picking them up with the crane. Um, girder handling, here's a project. This, this, um, these girders were actually field splice before they were set. Um, and they were set in pairs, so they went ahead and bolted up the diaphragms. Um, and you can see the blocking, they've got it blocked up with timber. Not only support it to keep it from damaging it, but when you're making a field splice on the ground before you hang the steel, you have to get that proper grade so that your camber and your girders is continuous. What's a, what's a quick and easy method to check to see once you bolt these uh, diaphragm or bolt these girders together and make that field splice? What's a quick and easy way to look and see if you got that proper camber? <coughs> You can pull the string, but you can also, you obviously, first of all, you can eyeball it, but if you go to that splice and you look at those two webs, you look up that top flange, look at the bottom, if one side has a wide open gap and the other one's tight, then you know something's probably not right, so those need to be pretty, pretty consistent. Um, but you got to get the proper grade before you tighten up that field splice. Um, kind of going, expanding on that field splice. Um, when we do have a field splice, whether it's on the ground or in the air, um, this is right out of the spec book. Um, when we, we bolt those, it, the spec requires that at least 50% of those holes be filled with a combination of drift pins, um, and they can also use 25% um, of the erection pins to get that field splice in the correct location before they tighten up and, and tension those first permanent bolts. Um, the more um, cylindrical erection pins or drift pins they use, the better, because those are 1 seconds in larger, and that just brings that into a tighter position uh, before you start bolting that splice together. So this is a requirement, so make sure that they are doing that. Um, if they do use some of their, uh, their erection bolts to, to meet this 50%, um, they need to take the nuts back out and then take the bolt out, screw it back on, make sure any of the threads have not stretched, but they're going to use that in, um, for their permanent fastener. They can use um, they can use other fasteners that are not that are just temporary for this purpose, and maybe they're painted a different color so they can recognize which ones those are and then take those out. They would, when if they run that if they use a permanent bolt like you said you got to check the thread, they'd be able to run that nut on that bolt by hand and then back off. If they didn't think any burrs or things to pull the thread on, we'll let them use that bolt. Yeah. Um. Girder handling, this is a picture. Um, you can see this small spall right here. It's a pre-stressed girder. Um, during delivery, all they did is wrap a chain over it, and obviously it spalled on each side of the um, top flange there. Um, typically, and I don't see this as a very often anymore, but they you know, have some kind of blocking over here to protect that top flange. Um, but the point is that just because it has a DOT approved stamp does not mean that it's approved. You guys, when it comes on site, you need to inspect it for spalls, for cracking, um, and then after it's set in its final location, um, inspect it again. Um, that's, that's our responsibility out in the field on the project. What about this one? We need to get MT to come out and inspect this one. Yeah, it's pretty obvious, I think. I think we see the cracks on that one. These kind of things can happen if they're not careful. Um, you know, this is an obvious, uh, they're going to have to replace this um, girder. 
but you know you get smaller smaller damage and you might not be able to see it so you might have to get M&T involved. Um, I had another project where they were contracted delivering a steel girder and they pulled up off the exit um, at the interstate and made a left and a truck ran in between the um, basically underneath the girder clipped the top of the truck off fortunately did not hurt the guy he was very lucky I don't know if he ducked or it was just or what it was a lucky day but um turned out it didn't have any damage to the girder but we did get it inspected and everything so those types of things happen either on the job site or in delivery talk a little bit about pick points um, avoid single pick points if possible uh, assuming this girder is um, more than 50 foot then a single pick point is not allowed by the specs anything over 50 foot they have to use a spreader bar um, in the spec book there is a chart um, that tells you what the distance between the hooks for your spreader bar can be and your overhang outside from your hooks out to the ends of the girder um, you can see here is the plate girder so in between hooks you can't go more than 100 feet without some kind of support and then 35 foot overhang um, this is a picture here fairly lengthy um, steel girder uh, you got a spreader bar here in the middle so they, they met the requirement for having two pick points but um, let's look at it a little closer here 117 foot plate girder 15 foot spreader bar you got 51 foot overhang so that does not meet that 35 foot um, so that way they would have had to have a longer spreader bar or two cranes in that case to meet our spec so we need to be looking at that and don't don't um, think think about it right the last minute riser are getting ready to set the girder go ahead and think about these and talk about it so um, they haven't long enough spreader bar um, in advance of those girders and the trucks start backing up on your project this particular bridge is the same picture where uh, they did the field splice on the ground and picked the girders up in pairs. Um, so you can see they got the two spreader bars on each crane and then you got your spreader bar here so they can pick them up in pairs, um, which that, was a, that met all the requirements and it was a good, good pick. Um, but if they do single point lifting um, or have excessive distances beyond those pick points, it can damage um, the flange um, by overstressing it. So we need to make sure we follow that spec. Um, getting a little bit into bearings now. Um, I'm going to talk about storage and handling, adjust, adjustments for temperature and rotation, and then a little bit about welding. Um, connection of the bridge superstructure to the bridge substructure <coughs> is accomplished through bearings and anchor bolts. Bearings allow the superstructure to expand and contract, which we all know that, but they also allow it to rotate. Um, most of the rotation is going to come out during your deck pour. When you get take all that camber out and you get your deflection, that's when it's going to do most of its rotation. But it's still they still allow after the fact to, to rotate some. Um, these are our most common types of bearings. You got your elastomeric bearing pads here. We see most often we see that kind. Pot bearings we see on our longer spans. Um, these are still continuous steel girders. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about both. Um, Storage of bearings, um, they need to be stored until immediately prior to setting the girders and then they need to have proper storage out of the elements. We don't want them just sitting out in the rain on the ground in the dirt. So make, you know, keep them in the connex, keep them protected. Um, it's particularly important for pot bearings. And we'll talk about that some more in just a minute. What's, uh, what's missing here in this picture? Got a little circle there to help point you in the right direction. What are we missing here? These are pot bearings. Missing that top plate. You can see the rest of these have this top plate. Um, apparently, um, something, something when they were working, knocked that top plate off. It's down in the water somewhere. We never want to see that top plate off of those pot bearings. If you want to see what one looks like, you can see this. We got more pictures of them taken apart. But this, uh, these pot bearings are filled with this elastomer, and it's got this bra these brass sealing rings around here, and then it's it's um, the bottom of this plate. It's like a smooth mirror Teflon finish that allows that to, to move back and forth. It's a very low friction um, sliding plane and if you get any dust or dirt or anything in there then it's not going to function like it's supposed to and it's going to end up wearing um, excessively. So these should never be taken apart. When they store them they should be wrapped up. When they get ready to set them everything should be should never be taken apart. Bearing layout. Um, prior to setting any bearings or girders, the centerline bearing and centerline bearing distance between bench should be checked by the contractor or inspector. Talked a little bit yesterday about layout. 
Um, you know, we should be pulling tape between vents and make sure we have the proper um, chain. Uh, chain. 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 Sorry. Pulling chain between vents to make sure those uh, caps and anchor bolts are laid um, laid out properly. But after everything's poured, anchor bolts are in before the girders arrive. Good idea to go ahead and pull the chain again, just to make sure before the girders arrive, so you don't realize you have a problem as the girders are arriving and you're setting them. Um, the goal, this is kind of a mouthful, but we'll get into it a little bit more. The goal is to orient both the sole plate, which is your top, your top plate, um, and the masonry plate, which is the plate that is, rests on the cap, so that it's 60 degrees Fahrenheit under the center line of the girder, which is where your, your bearing stiffener on your girder is, after the deck is cast, that all the elements line up along that center line of bearing. So we'll kind of go through an example here, so that kind of all that uh, makes sense. Uh, this is a detail of your pot bearings. Um, you got your fixed end over here, and then you got your expansion end on this side. Um, you kind of see this detail as the guide key detail. Basically, this top part of the sole plate, I mean, the top part of the pot bearing slides back and forth as the, as the girder expands and contracts. Um, and then you can see here, you got grout pots. Um, on this expansion end with your grout tube right here. This allows a little bit more movement of the masonry plate, which takes the whole assembly back and forth or sideways. Um, one, one thing you want to make sure of is this grout tube is out to the side of this uh, um, pot bearing and not turned the wrong way. As long as if you turn it the wrong way, you set a pot bearing on, you won't be able to fill it, and then you're, you're definitely in trouble. So make sure that's turned the right way. Um, this is just your masonry plate, just a square plate that's got holes for your anchor bolts and then your your uh, top plate up there. Right here is your table for plate setting. Um, this basically gives you your adjustments for temperature and end rotation. Um, up here is your detail of your pot bearing, your end of girder, and uh, this right here is your center line of your center line of bearing, and this little negative here is your orientation. So if you see a negative down here, that means that whenever you're adjusting for temperature and end rotation, that this has to slide towards that negative side. Your, your temperature adjustments are only for expansion. Right. If you're on a fixed, well, either one of them, you're only going to see that table in the plans for expansion bearings. You will not see that table for a fixed pop bearing. Right. Yep. So, your, your temperatures can have either a negative or positive. Your end rotation is going to be, it's going to always be negative, but that's your, that's your orientation. Um, the end rotation is the reason we have that is when that, before you pour your deck, your girder has got camber into it, it's built into it. And so it's shorter, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like a rainbow. Whenever you pour that deck and that thing expands or it deflects, it's going to lengthen out. So now it's going to be longer. So what that means is, to get that girder to set properly, you have to adjust that top plate and slide it closer to the fixed end so that it'll line up. Then whenever the, the, the deck is poured and you, it gets longer, then it lines back up in place. So that's what, that's, that's what the end rotation is for. Um, your temperature, obviously as temperature moves, it goes back and forth. So. Um, I'm gonna go through an example here. This is your cap. You got your masonry plates. Everything's square, lined up with the cap. Um, we'll, any adjustments for skew will be made later, so we don't worry about that right now at this point. Everything's square. Um, this is uh, your cap down here, your masonry plate, your, your cylinder of your pot bearing, and then your top plate, which is your sole plate. And back here's your back wall. So we're gonna go through the first example at 90 degrees. Um, our end rotation was negative 3 sixteenths of an inch. That's always going to stay the same no matter what the temperature is. All right, so like we said, negative was on this side, so we move it negative 3 sixteenths of an inch. All right, because our girder is shorter right now until we pour the deck. Now we've got to go, our chart said because it's hot, the girder is longer right now, so we've got to go plus 3 quarters of an inch. So we're going to move it back 3 quarters of an inch for a total of plus 9 sixteenths of an inch. That's our final location. Follow the logic. All right, let's do 30 degrees. It's cold outside, so everything's everything's shorter than it's going to be at 60 degrees. So we've got our end rotation, negative 3 sixteenths of an inch. That stays the same. We'll go ahead and make that adjustment. 
Now I've got to go negative 3 eighths for temperature. So go 3 eighths for a total of negative 9 sixteenths. We're on that side. Now whenever we pour the deck, the curve's going to get longer. It gets 60 degrees. It's going to get a little bit longer. Everything should line up with that dashed line. Um, <clears throat> when the girder is set as at the same temperature the bearing was adjusted to, the whole bearing assembly can be moved to line up with the bearing stepper. So basically what that's saying is that after, you, um, after you've made all your adjustments and pour everything, or you, you, you've adjusted everything, the, um, the uh, grout pots will allow you to um, adjust the whole assembly to line up so that bearing stiffener can line up with that center line of plate. Because it may not, after you've made your temperature adjustments, theoretically the bearing stiffener in that girder should line up with the center of that top plate. But if it's not, you can still make a little bit of adjustment by sliding the whole assembly. And that this, this um, right here is kind of demonstrates that. These are your grout pots. So we've made our adjustment for our temperature and end rotation, but it still doesn't quite line up with that bearing stiffener. So we can slide the whole assembly so that it lines up. All right, and now everything lines up with our bearing stiffener and this lines up perfectly. Um, one thing I didn't mention, but you need to do, you see these little red lines right here. You need to take, a, when, but when you have everything squared up and centered up, we need to take a little Sharpie, make a line on your top plate, your masonry plate, your center line of bearing on the cap and on the girder so that you know where you are, where everything is, so you know where the center is. Then we can set our girder down in place. Um, kind of a little bit out of alignment here, or out of order. Um, before we do set our girder down in place, We've adjusted for temperature on our uh, on our plate. Now's the time before we set our girder. We can adjust it for the skew. So if your girders are coming in at an angle, you can go ahead and make that adjustment now. So we go ahead and twist those around. Now we set our girder down. It's a little bit out of order. That's the last thing we do before we set our girder. We go ahead and make our our adjustments for temperature and in rotation. Then we adjust for skew. Right. Um, this picture here is a. Uh, Pot bearing that you can see this top plate here um, is pretty much exceeded its max or real close to exceeding its maximal range of movement. Um, we use pot bearings because it allows a lot of movement, but in this particular case, uh, it's getting pretty close to um, exceeding that. So I would suspect that maybe this thing wasn't set right for temperature; it wasn't adjusted properly before the girder was placed. This one here, uh, this particular project, the uh, there was an error on one of the um, orientation on our, our temperature chart. I can't remember if it was for end rotation or temperature. I believe it was the end rotation. Instead of having a negative, it had a positive. So they adjusted it the wrong way. And they went ahead and set the girder down. And you, know, you can see it here. It's not lining up. It's real close to the back wall. So they ended up having to jack this up and roll these girders forward to get everything to reline up. So make sure you... Un after going through the process, hopefully you kind of understand the theory of why you have to move it which direction. So if you do have a plan error, maybe you can catch that. Um, this particular pot bearing, you got this excess lubrication um, coming out. Uh, this was a concern. We, we talked with M&T. It turns out that um, one particular manufacturer's pot bearings has a tendency to put excess lubrication inside. We, you saw the elastomer inside the pot bearings on that one picture. <coughs> They, they have to lubricate that, and then they got those, um, like, uh, caulking that goes around the outside that keeps everything in, and um, it kind of leaks out. Anytime you have something like this leaking out or something, you, it's probably a good idea to raise the red flag and maybe have somebody look at it. Hopefully you'll never see it, but that elastomer is flexible, and it could, under a load or if something was wrong or something, it could squeeze out of those, those brass rings. Um, I, I've never seen it or heard of it happening, but I guess it can. So if you see anything other than just some lubrication leaking out, definitely call because that could mean a failure of the bearing. Um, this particular project, uh, you can see this beveled sole plate here. The girder is coming in on this grade right here, and it's supposed to have this beveled sole plate, but they turned the beveled sole plate the wrong way. And what that caused, you can see here, this all this this gap right here and back here is hardly any gap, so this caused that pot bearing to be rotated up like this. Um, that's obviously not good. It's not going to function like it's supposed to. Um, this particular project, the, the um, deck had already been poured, 
and traffic was on it, so they end up before I got caught, they had to end up jack um, jacking up the bridge. And s s this is one of those cases where we actually did remove the top plate. Um, got M and T manufacturer's rep out there, pulled the top plate off, cleaned it really good under a controlled environment, and and then flipped the sole plate around and got it put back in the right place. But you need to be paying attention to those those beveled sole plates. We have those a lot. <clears throat> and just make sure the orientation is correct that you turn it the right way because it can cause problems like this. All right, elastomeric bearing layout. Um, it's similar to pot bearings. Um, it's dependent on temperature, but there are no adjustments for temperature that we do. Um, our plan dimensions assume the ambient air temperature is 60 degrees Fahrenheit, so ideally we want to be setting these things as close to that um, temperature as possible. Um, that whole theory of everything lining up at 60 degrees after the deck is cast applies here too. This particular case, nothing lined up. Um, you can see here's our, center, our bearing step in our, um, here's our center line of sole plate. It's, you know, nothing's lining up. And this, this slot here is obviously what allows our expansion and contraction, and this anchor bolt's way over here. Um, so that doesn't give it much room to move. So uh, that could cause problems for sure. We ended up having to jack this one up, cut the weld, or reset the bearing, or the, uh, the last merit bearing pad. Um, Kind of along those lines, the specs just basically says do not restrict full and free movement of the superstructure at the bearings um, by improperly setting or adjusting um, the bearings or anchor bolts. Something that uh, you may see on some of your projects with longer spans, 120 foot or longer, um, is a plan note that basically says after you pour the deck and the deck is cured, the contractor is required to jack the, to jack the girders up and reset the elastomeric bearing pads so that everything lines up. And the reason for this, on these long spans, um, you get these long steel girders, we talked about end rotation on the pot bearings. Well, elastomeric bearing pads, you know, if you, you got this girder and you set it down and then you pour that deck and it gets longer, you're automatically building in all that stress into that elastomeric bearing pad and now when it gets hotter, it's gotta go even further. And so what we're doing is we're, we're leaving that stress from the deck pour and now it can adjust its range of movement for, for temperature. So, um, you know, you can look, if it's, if it's, you know, on your span, if you've looked and um, at 60 degrees Fahrenheit after you've poured a deck and it's perfectly vertical straight up and down, may not be a need to, uh, to jack it. Um, but if it is at 60 degrees, it's still kind of bent a little bit, like it's got that stress in there. That's, that's the reason for this plan though. Sometimes they will have a, they should have a, um, grout pot shown. I've had a plan that did not have the grout pot which allows for more adjustment and we don't need to weld the um, sole plate to the girder on this one until after the deck is cast so we can make that adjustment. Talk a little about welding prep. I'm not, it's not definitely not a welding class. I had enough of that yesterday. Um, basically what I want to point out with this is um, that before setting girders, the contractor, and I'm sure it's going to be the prime or the sub, it's not going to be the welder, needs to grind that surface of that sole plate. Um, if it's a uh, galvanized or painted sole plate or if it has rust on it, they need to grind that off before they set it because if you set that girder down and have not done that and then the welder comes in and grinds what he can see, when he makes that weld, that weld penetrates underneath there where that galvanization is that he couldn't grind off and it will contaminate the weld. So um, need to make sure we do it ahead of time um, right before we set the girder so the rust doesn't start forming back. And you can see here, um, got a rust starting to form back on these uh, these um, sole plates. So just prior to placement, we need to grind those off. Um, this is a picture of a uh, girder set on sole plate where the um, they welded it and did not paint it back. Um, it's really hard to get in here, you know, with this anchor bolt and nut and everything, get all that rust grinded off to recoat that weld. So just encourage them to go ahead and after they um, set the girders and get that welded, to go ahead and coat it back as soon as possible. It makes it easier, life easier on them. All right, diaphragm fit up. <coughs> Contractor fabricator's job to submit shop drawings for the girders and diaphragms and therefore their responsibility for proper fit up. But it does not always work out the way it was intended. Um, you can see here, you got one bolt to fit out of three. And other ones didn't line up. Same thing here, one bolt fit. This particular one, they didn't fit, so they got permission to uh, weld the diaphragm. So what do we do if diaphragms do not fit? Start calling everybody, calling the bridge engineer, start your design. 
First step, double check the shop drawings. Uh, these drawings are basically an erection plan that got member numbers, uh, marks, etc. So we need to make sure we got the right piece in the right location, the right orientation before we start making phone calls. Double check that first. Um, after that, what are possible fixes? Assuming everything is, um, you have it right. You, the specs allow us to ream bolt holes a maximum of 16th of an inch. Now, does that mean that we can ream every single bolt hole 16th of an inch? No, it's, it's, uh, it says do not excessively um, ream bolts. So if we have a few here and there that don't fit, you can, that is an option for the contractor to get, it, to get the diaphragm to fit up. Obviously, they can refabricate the diaphragm pretty obvious. Field weld, um, you need to get permission before you do this and it probably will not be uh, approved on curved girders, but um, that is an, it is a, an acceptable repair on occasion. Um, punch new holes and seal weld the old holes. Um, if it's really not lining up, that is an option that we can get approval on as well. Um, seal weld basically means basically just welding the inside of that hole. You don't have to completely fill the hole with the uh, weld material just to basically seal it off like it says. Um, but these last two are the star. Before you do those, you need to contact your BCE for approval on that. We may go through structure design possibly, but uh, um, these other two, you know, they can they can ream you know, a few holes here and there without going through any approval process. What not to do? What we don't want to do. This particular bridge, uh, you can see this girder is kind of out of plumb. Well, what happened was the diaphragm didn't fit up, so the contractor thought it would be a good idea to hook a come along to the bottom flange and pull it over until it did fit up. So instead of going through one of those other fixes, he, uh, he said, well, I'll just move the girder until it fits. So this is kind of what you ended up with, girders out of plumb. And at the bearing, you see this gap here, that's the bottom flange. You only got making contact on one side and it's sitting up on an angle here, right up against that anchor bolt and nut. And unfortunately, it didn't get caught until after the deck was poured. So now, you can't just go and jerk that thing over there and start inducing all kinds of stresses into the deck. So we had to live with this. So what we had to do, we had to jack the, jack the girder up, have the contractor fabricate a beveled sole plate, weld it to the, the bottom of that girder and to that sole plate, and that's what we got. So, um, Which all bridge went together. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, those, those things we've got to look out for. That was, I don't know who thought that was a good idea, but um, that's what they did. So, don't need to be doing that. All right, girder rotation. I'm, I'm getting ready to confuse you, because I just told you, I said, what I say? Don't, don't pull our girders out of plumb, right? Make sure they're, they're plumb, make sure our diaphragm fits. All right, now I'm getting ready to just blow your mind. Girder rotation. On heavily skewed bridges, particularly with these, these Long spans, tall girders, steel girders. Um, here's your center line of bearing. You've got your girder lines right here. These are your intermediate diaphragms. Right here on this, this girder number two, you got you don't have that much distance from here to the end bent. Over here, you got this long, unsupported length. So what happens during the deck pour? You end up with having more deflection on this outside girder at this point than you do right here because it's stiffer right here. So what does that cause? What, what happens when you do that? The girders end up rotating because it pulls that unsupported length and it flex more, it's going to pull that other girder that way. So everything on that end tends to rotate counterclockwise. All right. Then we go to our bent, the opposite side, have more deflection on this side than we do right here. This is stiffer, this has got a long unsupported length girders rotate in the other direction. So what happens at one end bent, your girders are doing this, the other end bent's doing like this. So we, after the deck port is cured, you go out there and you look and your girders are out of plumb. Had anybody, anybody seen that or noticed that on any of your bridges? All right, this is what, that's the end result. <coughs> so the fix, total dead load fit up. This is something that's new. We've had one trial project we did a supplemental agreement on, on in Cameron's area to try it to see if it would work. And this is probably something that's going to start showing up in future plans. It's not in any of your plans right now, but it could be in the future. What you'll see, I have a plan note on your dead load deflection table that said this bridge has been designed for total dead load fit up. Basically what that is, is we're going to start with our girders out of plumb. I just told you don't put your girders out of plumb. Now I'm telling you, you may have to in the future. And then after that 
rotation process goes through during the deck pour, our end result is they're going to be plumb. Basically, right now, um, when we give our plans to the, to the contractor, the uh, fabricator of these girders and diaphragms, they do their shop drawings, they figure out all their geometry, how, where the bolt holes are located for their diaphragms, how everything fits up. And they basically take that girder with that camber before that camera comes out, before the deck's poured, and they figure out, okay, my diaphragm, you know, is this long, figure out where my bolt holes are, so that when you get your girders out in the field, you hook up your diaphragm, everything ideally fits up perfectly. What they're going to start doing when you have this plan note is they're going to go ahead and account for, when they figure their geometry for where those bolt holes and diaphragms fit up, they're going to account for that dead load already being taken into account so that when you go to, if you try to fit those diaphragms up before the deck's poured, they won't line up. So what you have to do is you have to maybe make one connection with one bolt and then lean the girder over to where it fits up. And so basically through that process going through each girder, you have to contract to pull that top flange over to get those diaphragms to fit up. We're not pulling on the bottom flange, we pull it on the top to get everything lined up. So, like I said, Right now, we don't put our curves out of plumb, but in the future, if, you, if, on, if and only if you have that plan note, you'll have to. This is basically, this is uh, right out of an AASHTO report that basically talks about this. This is not just something NCDOT is doing, um, but it goes through a step-by-step -step process of going through each girder and pulling, you know, pulling one out of plumb so the diaphragm fits up until they're all, all the diaphragms are bolted up and the girders are out of plumb. So on the end bent, it'll be out of plumb one way, at the bent, it'll be out of plumb the other way. So you just have to pull on those girders until they fit up. And we're not talking about a lot, you know, a couple inches probably. So the key thing to remember is when your girders look like this, was it done on purpose? So If you, like I said, you don't ever pull around on them like that to come along unless you've got that plan note. If you do have that plan note, somebody is more than likely going to be asking you to go out there and do this right here twice. Before they pour the deck, after you get everything bolted up, they're going to want you to take a level and a stick rule and go out there and tell them how out of plumb your girders are. And then they're going to want you to go back after the deck pour and do it again and see if they actually did what we were thinking. So if you, if you happen to get one like that or you end up getting one through supplement agreement or something, take some measurements before and after so we can see what we're actually getting compared to what the brain trust says it's supposed to do. Yeah. And all this is theoretical. So, um, but you know, we, we're getting girders out of plumb right now after the deck's poured on these heavily skewed bridges. So more than likely it's gonna, even if it's not perfect, it's gonna get better. Like Cameron said, we need, we'll probably be asked to check it. And hopefully, you know, as they come out, they'll probably start out just few and far between. So we'll be aware of them. You know, we'll be pointing it out in the pre-con, talking with you about it. So you'll be aware of this on your project. But it's one of the, the uh, that one bridge that where the contractor pulled out of plumb kind of spurred well, and we we're trying to figure out what our topics were going to be we, you know we figured we'd talk about that you know diaphragm fit up and it just kind of was a good lead into this since we'll be seeing this in the in the near future probably so didn't want to confuse you but I want you want you guys to understand what you might be seeing any questions all right y'all had enough structure training two days work you got it all sunk in I <laughs> We appreciate y'all's attention. Thanks for coming. I hope y'all have a great time.